able to stand, would you stand, open your Bible with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 2. As we turn there, our kids are dismissed to their classes. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. When you got it, say so. so. It says, I implore Eodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel. With Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your presence that is here, God. Thank you for these beautiful reminders, Lord, of who you are and that we know that your name is great, that you are a strong tower, that you are a mighty God. And we give you glory that we are, in, that we are able to come into your presence as we sing. And we know that you're here, Lord God, even as we hear your word. And so, God, I pray that you remove distractions from our minds and our hearts, that you would captivate us in these next few moments and that you would speak and that we would hear what your spirit is saying to your church, but that we would not only hear, but that we would respond in faith. We pray this in Jesus' good name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And so we are continuing on in our Indivisible series, and so we've been going through the book of Philippians, and we're coming toward the latter part of the book of Philippians in this last chapter, and today I want to talk to you about peace. I want to talk to you about peace, but I don't just want to speak to you about peace. I want to talk to you specifically about unified peace, unified peace, that we have to not only have the peace of God, but how important it is for us to be unified as we walk in this peace. As I've been saying since the beginning of this series in the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians has a theme of unity that runs throughout it from the beginning to the end. We see that Paul is telling the people of Philippi, have this mind, be of one mind, have a specific mindset, and that is, and that mindset will enable unity. And then here we come to where the apostle speaks about peace, but he starts off the this exhortation and exhorting these two women, um, Eodia and Syntyche, to have this peace, to be of the same mind. And so it's important for us to have the same, the same mind in order for us to be unified in peace. And I want you to realize this is that we were created, I don't know if you know this, but we were created to live in peace. When God created man, I mean, just think for a moment, if you can, just rewind, go back to the beginning of creation. The scripture says that in the beginning, you know, the, 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 the world was formless and void and the spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters of the deep. And then God said, let there be light and light was. And so we walk through this whole creation narrative and then we come to this, this moment where God puts Adam and Eve in the garden. I mean, that place was tranquil. Well, come on now. That place was peaceful. There was work, but it wasn't the kind of work we have today. And so even in work, there was peace. Glory to God. Even in, even in, their, in their efforts of tilling the ground, even in their efforts of being fruitful, in their efforts of doing whatever it was that God called them to do, there was still peace. 
This peace, this reign of God's presence was there. We were created to live in peace and we should still be seeking to walk in peace, but realize that even after the fall, God wants us to be vessels of peace. He wants you and I to be vessels of peace in this world. And here's what I know is that we cannot be vessels of peace if there is discord, if there is division, which is why the enemy wants to divide us because here's what happens. If the enemy can divide the church, he disrupts our mission. Are you here? When the enemy can get us on sidebar conversations, when the enemy can get us overwhelmed with things that should not be overwhelming us, he, he disrupts the mission. But here's the thing that is even worse. He is successful in diminishing our power to bring peace. He's successful in diminishing our power, our ability to bring peace. Now, I want you to understand something about peace and why this matters so much. The book of Romans chapter 14, the apostle Paul coming toward the end of that book as well, speaking to the church of Rome. And as he is speaking to them, they are having disputes about eating foods, like uh, meats, because in that time, these, some of these meats were sacrificed to, to animals, to the gods of that day. So when you went to the meat market, you, it was potential that the food that you were going to buy, the animals were sacrificed to pagan deities. And so there was one group of Christians that they were like, man, you can't be eating that defiled food, that food that has been sacrificed unto the gods. And then there was another group of people, I probably would have fell into this group, hallelujah, who said, you know what? If I pray and give thanks for this food, it is sanctified. You know why? No matter who it was sacrificed to, my prayer exes out the sacrifice. Amen. Some of y'all would have been on that group with me and be like, come on, Bishop, preach, Bishop. <laughs> and yet what was happening was because of that, there was division. People looking down their nose at people like, oh, how are you eating that food? You're a heathen. Come on now. <laughs> you're unrighteous. You're, 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 you're not sold out to the Lord. And the other group of people that is there, they're like, man, why are you so weak-minded? Why, so, why, 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 why are you so weak, man? Why, why, where's your faith, right? Like these groups, you know, we kind of hear some of that stuff today, don't we? Those divisive things. And you know what Paul says? Paul says this. He says, the kingdom of God is not eat. It is not eat or wine or drink. It is not eat or drink. But it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now think about those words. He said the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the rule of God is righteousness. It's not the food you eat. The kingdom of God is peace. It's not the food you eat. The kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because the reign of God, the rule of God is manifested in righteousness. It is manifested in peace. It is manifested in joy. And so when the enemy can get us to be divided over things, what he does is he diminishes our ability to be an influence and in vessels of peace within this world. Think about this this morning. Apart from the peace offered in the gospel, the church has nothing to offer the world. Let that sink in for a moment. Apart from the peace offered in the gospel, the church has nothing to offer the world. Listen, let me help you. Let me, let me help you understand this. A rich person, a group of philanthropists, they could go in, they could buy up property, and they could take care of all the poverty issues. Listen, all the millionaires and people that we have that talk all this stuff in our culture, all they got to do is put their money where their mouth is, there'll be no poverty. Hello, somebody. But let me, tell, let, let, let me say something to you. You don't need Jesus to do that. You don't need the gospel to do that. Should the church care about the poor? Somebody say yes. Amen. Amen. We should care about the poor. But what I want you to know is that it's not just about putting food in someone's mouth. It is not just about putting clothing on someone's back. It is not just about putting a housing around somebody's life. No, it is about the peace of God. See, because the fact is this, some wise doctor or scientist can come up with a cure to cancer. They can come with a cure to AIDS. They, they can come, somebody may do that. But can I tell you something? There is only one antidote for the chaos in the hearts of people. And it is the gospel. And church, we have to remember that that is the primary thing that we need to be concerned about. Because at the end of the day, other people can do other things that are dealing with tangible stuff and temporal stuff. But we are dealing with eternal things. 
The gospel is about eternity. The gospel is not about just this moment in time. And yes, I believe that the gospel comes in and it fixes stuff and it changes stuff and it should give you the right mindset and give you direction. Absolutely. But here's what I know. The gospel changes you eternally. Changes you eternally. And church, here's the thing. Apart from the peace that comes through the gospel, the church has nothing to offer the world. Our message of peace comes from the gospel. So the first thing I want to ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, unity in the body, unity in the body. is a prerequisite and preservative of peace. Unity in the body is a prerequisite and a preservative to peace. We have to have unity in order for there to be peace. And, and not just that, but it also preserves the peace among us when we strive for unity. Pastor Aldo said it weeks ago, I've been quoting him for weeks, fight for fellowship. What does Paul say? Look what Paul says in verse 2. He tells these two women, he says, I implore, I beg, I urge. He, he is passionate in this plea. I plea with these women, with the odia. And syntyche to what? To be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Because sometimes we think that stuff is new. You realize that this is about 2,000 years old, this, this, this history lesson I'm giving you right here. And you realize 2,000 years, years ago, roundabout, there was women having issues. Come on now. I know y'all ladies want to hear that. There was men having issues too, but what I'm saying is, in this moment, the apostle Paul calls out two women, and I want you to know they weren't just any women, they were two women who you're going to see in the next verse, who were laborers in the gospel. These were Christian women, and guess what? 2,000 years ago, people were beefing in the church. Come on now. Prominent people, important people were arguing and having divisions and there was issues that was dividing the church even back then. You know what I love about the way that Paul does this is he doesn't tell us what they were divided over. You know why? I'm going to tell you why I think. This is my opinion, right? I, I looked because I was like, man, what were they beefing about? What was wrong with these two women, you know? And, and why were they, why did Paul just, you know, out of nowhere, it seems like, say, hey, Eodia and Syntyche, y'all need to get it right. But nobody knows what they were arguing about. But, but, but they, listen, ladies, you're going to get excited about this. They were important enough to the unity of the church that Paul called them out. Their unity mattered. We didn't know why they were divided. You know why I believe that God doesn't show us why they were divided? Because here's what would happen. If God showed us why they were divided, you know what you would do? You'd look at it and say, well, that's not the reason I'm divided from someone. So you know what he says? Don't worry about why they're divided. Worry about why they should be united. Don't worry about why they are separated. Don't worry about what they're beefing about. Don't worry about what that issue is. Worry about the fact that they should be not pulling to the left or to the right. They should be pulling to the center. Why? Because the gospel brings us together. What does the gospel do? The gospel brings peace between God and man, but it also brings peace between man and man. That's what the gospel does. It brings peace. And so Paul says what? Be of this same mind in the Lord. Well, here's what I realized, church, is that we can, we can, we can fight for what? We can fight for agreement in our thinking, but we got to fight for it. Because, you know, it's easy to walk together at certain points, right? Like when everything is all right and we agree on everything, it's all good. I heard somebody say a long, long time ago, you know, submission hasn't happened until disagreement happens. Let me say it again submission hasn't happened until disagreement happens. In other words, for those of you in marriage, right, there, there's this thing, it's called mutual submission. I know, ladies, you thought I was coming at you. No, 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 let's talk about it. Mutual submission. The scripture says we are to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord, right? Mutual submission. Check this out. The fact is this, is that you may feel like you are such a submitted spouse, hallelujah, until disagreement comes. Until you start to feel, you, you feel like you are, the, you are the exemplary member of the body of Christ. I never disagree. We don't have a lot of those here, hallelujah. I never speak up. I never say anything. Ha. Until there's disagreement. 
until somebody says something, asks you to do something that you ain't feeling. Now, all of a sudden, wait a second, hold on a second. Is that biblical? <laughs> Bishop, is that is what you're saying? Does that have biblical, you know, like foundation? Is that, is that contextual, Bishop? You know, like, you know, right? Like, like we start talking to each other and you're, and you're, you're hey, hey, we need to do this. Wait, wait a second. Is that, is that biblical? Is, all of a sudden we get biblical, right? We, we got to make sure, right? We're, we we got to make sure things are right. But here's the thing that has to happen, that we see these two sisters and, God, and, and Paul is saying, hey, have the same mind in the Lord. What mind is he talking about? He's talking about the mind of Christ. Remember our memory verse? Let this mind be in you that also was in Christ Jesus. This mind of submission, this mind of suffering, this mind of humility, this mind of surrender, this mind of service. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Don't allow things to pull you apart. Allow these things to bring you together. Church, we cannot allow the enemy to use anything to divide us. Are you here? Why does this matter? Well, you know, you ever, have you ever walked into someone's house and you just felt something? You didn't hear them arguing, but you knew. There was, there was some tension going on prior to your arrival, glory to God. You see, the same thing occurs among the people of God. See, we think that we can just pull to the left or pull to the right. I'm just going to hold to my opinion. I'm going to think my way. I'm going to, you know what, we're just going to agree to disagree. I think there's some things we can agree to disagree on. Because I, I, there's some things aren't even worth, you know, the, the popcorn. You know what I'm saying? It's it not even worth it. That's not, not even worth the drama that's going to be involved in that discussion. But that's not as many things as we just decide we're not going to talk about. Because there's some things we got to talk about. You see, there's a spiritual attack that comes against the church. And it is not just about you and me. And it's not just about how, you know, we're feeling. There is something that happens in the atmosphere, church. And you have to realize this. The enemy has been working overtime from generation to generation to generation seeking to divide the church because what? If he can get the church divided, he has a foothold in the church and he hinders us from being able to move forward in the mission of God. You know what the problem is with us? Many of us are just, we're happy enough being saved. We're happy enough. It's, hey man, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I ain't got to like them people. Come on. I ain't got to get along with them people. I don't got to worry about them people. Them people are your brothers and sisters. What you mean them people? <sighs> them people. You know, your people got, yeah, that's your people. Hello, somebody. Some of us forget about our people, you know, like, like we forgot where we came from. We forgot what we've been saved to, brothers and sisters in Christ. But, let, but, but, but let, let's, let's take a little bit further because I know I talked about the division between these two women. But look at verse 3 because I love this. He says, I urge you also, true companion. So who's, who's a true companion? Again, we don't know who the true companion is, but he is someone who is a laborer in the Lord. He's a laborer in the kingdom. And look at what he says here. He says, help these women. Pause. You know what he says? Don't leave them on their own to figure it out. Help them. Help them get over themselves, glory to God. Help them come back to this place of unity. Can I tell you something, church? It's important that we don't let anything divide us, but it is also important that we do not sit there in silence when we see the enemy, when we see emotions, when we see opinions being brought into the church that are dividing us. Are you hearing me? Listen, don't sit by and be a coward. You see something popping up. You see division. You see just something. You know well enough that this thing is going to create a problem. Don't just sit there and get into your little gossip corner. Come on now. You've got to be a person. Don't just take it to prayer either. Pray about it for sure, but don't just leave it there. You need to be a person who is a person of God, a man or woman of God, that when you see division rising up, you speak up. Listen, that's tough to do. Because you want to get in people's business. One of, the, one, of the, one of the statements that I probably hate the most from, you know, from the pulpit, especially when we're greeting our guests, is when we say, hey, we want to get up all up in your business. I hate that statement. But here's the thing. After you're no longer a guest and your family, guess what? I'm all up in your business. That's what family is, whether you like it or not. You are all up in each other's business, right? We are supposed to be in each other's business. We're not supposed to be secluded in this room, that room. We're supposed to be engaged. Hello, somebody. 
Not allowing the enemy to bring division. We got to speak up, church. We got to speak up. We got to, we, listen, we got to encourage conversation. You know, those people come to you and they're like, hey, man, you know, Pastor Aldo said something that I'm just like, mm, I'm going to blame him, not me, but hmm. Pastor Aldo, he said something. I'm not, I'm not really feeling that. You know what you need to do? You need to smile at them and say, hey, have you talked to Pastor Aldo about that? And, you know, we were in Connect, and Sister Evelyn, she said something that, oh, I don't know. Hey, did you talk to Sister Evelyn about that? Because you know what's probably going to happen? Man, no, 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 okay. You know what's probably going to happen, too? Sister Evelyn's going to rub them wrong again at some point. Pastor Aldo's going to say something wrong again at some point. You know what they're going to do? They're going to come back to you and be like, hey, but hey, check this out. Remember last time we talked about this? Hey, since you haven't talked to them, how about this? I'll let them know you got to talk to them. How about that? I, I, I will encourage such a meeting of the mind so you can come together and have a conversation rather than walking in division, letting the enemy separate us. Are you here, church? We have to be part of the solution, not part of the division. And when you sit by in silence and you don't say anything, you're part of the problem. Don't let these sisters do what they want to do. But you know what Paul does? He does something. You know this verse. This is one of our favorite verses. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. You know what? You, you know what God told Nehemiah when they were in the middle of this building project, they were being attacked by the enemy. He told him this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The gospel of peace is where we get our strength and our ability to rejoice. Not just have joy once, but continue in the joy of the Lord. Continue in the joy of the Lord. Being, being reminded. See, this is why we have to be gospel-centered people. We have to be people. The reason why we partake of communion every week is because it seems like in the scriptures, where every time the body of Christ got together, they partook of communion. That was something they did. But why did they do that? Because they needed to be reminded of the gospel. They needed to be reminded that what? That, that we are born into sin. We are separated from God. We can do nothing to save ourselves. And yet Jesus came and died in our place. He died. He shed blood to wash us clean. He, his body was broken so that way we could have life and life abundantly. But Jesus didn't just die. He rose again. He rose again, which gives us what? Gives us hope, gives us peace, brings peace from the king and now the kingdom can move through us but church if we're not fighting for division if we're, i mean if we're not fighting against division fighting for fellowship fighting for unity you know what we're doing we're hindering the kingdom of god from moving the way that god wants to move through us so we we have to fight for unity we have to fight for unity can i tell you something god has given us the tool that we need in order to walk in unity you know what that is God's word. God's word. We walk together because of what God's word says. We agree with what God says. Not what I feel, because I'm not always feeling it. Come on now. You're not always feeling it. No matter how spiritual you are, you have days you're not feeling it. I'm just gonna let you know that right now. Whether you admit it or not, there's days you ain't feeling it. There's days you don't want to be in that word. There's days you don't want to live righteously. There's days you don't want to have conversations. There's days you don't want to be nice and loving and gracious and kind. There's days, but you know what God says? Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always and again, I say rejoice. Why? Because the joy of the Lord, the reminder of the gospel, that is the strength for us to do what? To continue to walk in unity. Why? Because the gospel of peace brings joy. Are you here? When we think about the gospel, it should bring us joy and a reminder to rejoice. And what that joy does is that joy in the gospel preserves our peace, but also makes us seek peace. That joy in the gospel encourages unity, but it also fuels the mission. You know why I'm motivated? I'll never forget when I first became a Christian. Man, I was so overwhelmed by the revelation of Jesus. I could not shut up. I still can't shut up. But anyway, <laughs> I couldn't shut up. My friends, 
They would hear, no matter what we were doing, I was telling them about what God was, was doing in my life. I was communicating because that's what was happening. That was real. That is what was going on in me. You know what happens to us as Christians? We forget about that. We, we, we get so caught up in life. We get so caught up in the, you know, checklist that we've got to go through in life. We get so caught up in the goals or the whatever it is that we got that we forget about that saving grace. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Second thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say our gentleness. Oh, come on, y'all. Our gentleness. There we go. Is a reflection of an eternal disposition guarded by peace. So a few years back, we had, or a few months back, we were at Forge. And for those of you who don't know what Forge is, Forge is a men's Bible study. I'm one, of, I'm one of the table leaders there, part of the leadership team. It's a men's group that gathers on Tuesday mornings in Oviedo. It gathers on Thursday mornings in Longwood. And they also have a Zoom call that they're doing on Tuesdays at lunchtime. And so if you want to get connected, there's ways for you to get connected. I encourage you to do that because it gives you an opportunity to be around other men that are trying to grow in the grace and the knowledge of who God is. It's not this week, so you can't come this week. Got to be next week, all right? Throw that out there. But here's what happens. When, 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 when we, were, we were sitting down around a table a couple of months ago, and um, Dr. Pete said, hey, I want you guys to look at this scripture. And he gave us this text. And as we we're going through the text, after 20 years of reading this text, I never realized this verse that we're about to look at. I never even noticed this verse. But look at what he says here in verse four um, 5. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, now, now this, to me, I think we have to realize something. We are living in a time that is closer to the coming of the Lord than ever before. I mean, just mathematically, right? Like, that's true. But when we look at what's going on prophetically in our world, we look at what's going on around the world. We look at what's going on in our nation. We look at what's going on around us and we realize that we are living in what is known as the last days. We are living closer to the coming of the Lord. And what does Paul say? He instructs these people in Philippi. He tells them, let your gentleness be known to all. And so again, our gentleness is a reflection of an eternal disposition guarded by peace. See, the only way that I can walk in this peace that God is taught, calling me to walk in is because I am looking at things from that eternal place. In the first service, we didn't sing the, the latter part of the songs that they sang. But the latter part of the song that they sang, and I just got to give credit because, you know, everything was coinciding so well. So whether you guys planned it or not, but, you know, you had the, the light shining, you know, through the trees. And it was like just a beautiful picture of, of, of the heavens cracking open and the glory of God coming forward. And then we began to sing those words about when we are in him, when we are in heaven, when we go there. And we're thinking about what? We're thinking about eternity. We're thinking about the eternal reign with God that we will be in. We're looking forward. We're not stuck in what's going on here, but we're looking. We're reminded for a moment that we're just passing by, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world, that our kingdom is not of this world, but our kingdom is one that is to come. We walk in peace because of what? because we are reminded of this eternal reality. And you know what overflows from that? Gentleness. Not harsh, rude, disrespectful attitude. No, no, no. See, here's the fact. The fact is that the scriptures teach us what? That in these latter days, church, we're going to experience persecution. Even in these beloved United States of America. Oh, no, that'll never happen. Oh, you better wake up. Oh, it's going to happen. I know you think about China. You think about people being beheaded for their faith. You think about people in the underground church, and that's everywhere else except in this free nation. Let me, let, let me encourage you real well. Read the book of Revelation. Do me a favor. Tell me if you find America.
That's heavy, is it? Is it not? Go read it. Don't be afraid of it. You're a believer. Your faith is supposed to be strong. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of hardship, in the midst. Listen, I'm not saying that I want all hell to break loose in America. I'm not telling you that. I pray that God will be merciful. I'm praying for one more move of God before he returns. I'm praying for a move of God that outlasts that outlast me, my grandkids, my great-great-grandchildren, my great-great-great-grand. I'm praying that God will do that. But just like Nineveh, guess what? Nineveh had a prophetic word that was over them. They repented and God relented for 140 years. But ultimately, what happened? Nineveh fell because they returned to their rebellion. But here's the truth. The truth is persecution is going to happen. Sin is going to abound. Church, we're the light, we're the salt. We are supposed to be against the immorality and the moral decay of our culture. We are here to preserve morality. We are here to preserve the light and life of the truth of God's word. We are here to to, to inject the truth and influence our culture and righteousness. But the fact is, sin will abound. People will get used to calling good evil good and good evil. That's what we see in our days. Wake up, church. This is where we are. Stop being silent. Open your mouth. Communicate truth. No matter who it offends, because at the end of the day, persecution is going to happen. Sin is going to abound. And you know what else is going to happen? The love of many is going to grow cold. But you know what the truth is? The truth is this. The mandate of the church doesn't change. We're called to be the light that shines in the midst of the darkness. We're called to be those who speak the truth in love. Listen, the reason why I'm so passionate is because I love you, because I care about people, and I'm compelled by the love that God has to do what? To call people to repentance, to call people to faith, to call people out of cowardice, to call people to live for the glory and the honor of God. We are called to be relentless witnesses for the gospel in the midst of this world. But you know what Paul says? Let your gentleness be evident to all men. Can I tell you something? If you're, if you're bound in anxiety, you can't be gentle. Think about this. What is anxiety? Because the next verse says what? And be anxious for nothing. And be anxious for nothing. He didn't say, be anxious for some things. That isn't what he said. Be anxious for nothing. Think about when you have been the most foul. You know what anxiety is? Anxiety is is the product of insecurity. You don't know what's going to happen. Are there any points of anxiety in our culture right now? Yeah. Church, God already spoke to you. Be anxious for nothing. See, when you are at peace, guess what you're able to do? Be gentle. When you're not at peace, at least I know when I'm not at peace. I'm nasty, man. I'm foul. I'm not gentle. I'm harsh. You're in my way. Why are you doing that? And so God says what? He says, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. These are promises, right, that God is giving us. He's communicating something to us, but here's what he's showing us. He's showing us these words here. You you and I cannot produce peace, but you know what we can do? We can position ourselves for peace. That's what he says. Be anxious for nothing. Don't complain. Pray. See, we have a choice in the matter, do we not? We can sit down with each other and we can complain and talk about conspiracies and talk about this and talk about that. And we can be worried about them and we can worry about, hold on a second. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer. But church is not just praying and say, God, please. No, no, no. And supplication so that begging, broken, 
Humility before God. God, you are our only hope. Church, 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 hear me when I say this. Everything that we have seen going on right now and even the last four years have been a wake-up call from the Lord for the church. We have to wake up. We have depended on men to do things that only God can do. We have been more committed to men than we've been committed to God. God is calling us to wake up, to cry out to him, to supplicate before him, to let him know, God, you are our hope. By prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Lord, I prayed about it. Lord, I've cried about it. Now I give you thanks for it. We're about to walk up on the Thanksgiving. People try to cancel Thanksgiving. Come on now. Keep them 100. Don't get around family. Some of y'all are like, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I know some of y'all are like, thank you, Lord. We can't do it, babe. I'm sorry. We can't, we, we can't gather. We can't get family around. Amen. Some of y'all are like, amen, COVID, come back next November. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> come on, man. Y'all know it's true, right? It's a, listen, the fact of the matter is what? Is that many people communicated the most stressful time is when? Holidays. When you got to get around family. Hallelujah. Y'all had all year to pray, glory to God. Y'all had all year to supplicate. Y'all had all year to get ready. You wait until whatever, the Tuesday before Thursday, hoping God does something, glory to God. <sighs> it's about posture, church. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. It's about posturing yourself so that way the peace of God, the kingdom of God can reign and rule in you and be manifested through you. See, here's the fact. The fact is this, is that when God's peace guards our hearts, it will guide our actions. When God's peace guards our hearts, it will guide our actions. We'll be able to love our enemies because what? God's peace. His kingdom is reigning. He is on his throne, not just in words, not just in songs that are sung, in my heart. The third thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say right focus and right living. Assure the God of peace is with us. Right focus and right living assure the God of peace is with us. We're getting ready to close here. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. Very important. Paul says, finally. You know, when someone gets to the final, like, I'm closing up. Finally. <sighs> Some of y'all are like, finally. Yes, amen, amen. I still got three minutes and 57 seconds. <sighs> finally. Brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Here's my question. What are you meditating on? What are you meditating on? In this moment, what are you meditating on? Listen, I had, I had to shut all things. I, I barely watch the news right now, straight up. I pick and choose what I'm listening to because I already know. I, I, I know where I want to hear people say stuff. I don't want to hear people analyze stuff. Come on now. That's been our biggest problem in our culture right now is that people listen to analysts more than they listen to facts. I'm just saying, just throw that out there. And depending on which way your analyst leans, that's the way you lean, whether you like it or not. Come on now. But you, you got to shut some of that stuff down because, I, because you start doing what? Because everybody's upset right now. The left is upset. The right is upset. The middle's upset. Glory to God. Everybody's mad at this moment. I mean, we're all just belligerent, ridiculous, disrespectful. Come on now. What are you meditating on? Are you meditating on those things that are true? Are you meditating on those things that are pure? Are you meditating on those things that are lovely? 
Are you meditating on those things that are righteous, those things that are noble? Are you me- what are you meditating on? What are you constantly rehearsing in your mind, in your heart? We met with the men yesterday, and for those of you guys that couldn't make it, Saturday mornings at 8 o'clock, we'll be here next Saturday. But we were talking about being spirit-fed men, men who are fed by God's word, men who are in the word of God. Church, let me tell you something. You and I need to make sure that God's word is elevated to the highest position of authority in our lives. Not me, not you, not someone's opinion. God's word. Listen, we have to elevate the word of God. We have to elevate it. Why? Because it is from God's word that we get clarity, we get truth, we get peace. It is through God's word that we appreciate creation. Hello, somebody. It is through God's word that we are able to walk in this peace. And so the apostle Paul shows us how we battle against this anxiety. You know, we do, we decide what we're going to meditate on. And what does this meditation do? This meditation creates an environment for God to move. Creates an environment for God to move. When you gather together, you're not bringing anxiety to the conversation. You're bringing the Prince of Peace to the conversation. Because what have you been meditating on? Ah. See, the fact is this. And listen, I I want you to know I'm not pointing the fingers at you. I point the fingers at myself as well. Whenever you are meditating on stuff, guess what? That comes out in your conversation. You can't help it no matter how hard you try. You're hanging out 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It's coming. It's coming. It's You tried. You tried hard. But before you know it, boom, you're there. Why? It's in your heart. It's overflowing in your heart. It's overflowing in your conversation. So you know what, church? You know what that means? We need to create an environment for God's spirit to move. We need to create an environment for God's spirit to move. And here's the thing. We need to re- realize that it's not just about my race. It's about our race. It's not just about my peace. It's about our peace. It's about us, all of us, collectively being encouraged. Meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Think about these things. When you see your brother and sister, the same way that I gave you the little explanation of how you should deal with people who are bringing gossip to you or bringing complaints to you about other brothers, let me encourage you the same way. That you, when you see your brother, your sister that are going through it, man, you need to bring them up in prayer. And then you know what you do? Send them some scriptures to meditate on. Give them a call and say, hey, man, you know, I'm praying for you. You know, for some of you, if you got an iPhone, if you have, if, you know, if you have that other demonic phone, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but if you have an iPhone, there's an option there. Pastor Frank was actually the one that, that, that turned me on to this. But if you go on iPhone to iPhone, you know what you can do? You can actually do a little voice recording for them. And you know what? That encourages folks. It encourages me. I'm like, man, I get to hear somebody's voice. Speak words into their life. Speak God's word. Speak lovely, true, pure, righteous, holy, just things. Speak those things to them. Don't just go at it by yourself and don't let them go by themselves. You may see them on Facebook. You may see them wherever. You, look, be that vessel of peace. See, because here's what happens. If you and I allow cynicism to consume our thoughts and compromise to govern our lives, we not only get robbed of peace, but we have nothing to offer the world. Think about that. If we allow the cynicism of what is going on in our world to get the best of us, then guess what? Our peace is robbed. Because what does Paul go on to say here? Look at verse 9. He says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw. So what did he say? The things that you learned, right here, you're learning some stuff. The things that you received while we were hanging out or you were hanging out with someone that's a Christian and you saw the way that they were, you received some stuff. The things that you heard, the things that you weren't necessarily hearing and preaching or teaching, but the things that you heard in conversation, the things that you saw, the way, listen, those things, he says what? He says, these do. Those things that are righteous, those things that are pure, those things that are servant hearted, those things, those things, do those things. And what does he promise? Look at the promise. And the God of peace will be with you. That's a beautiful promise, is it not? Meditate on righteous things. Live righteously. And the God of peace, he'll be with you. If you're not meditating on the right things, you're not creating the atmosphere for him. If you're not living righteously, you're not creating the atmosphere for him. What does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians not to grieve the Holy Spirit. 
You know what that means? It means don't offend him. Don't push him away. How do we push him away? How do we grieve him? Oh, we grieve him with our sin against him. We grieve him with our disobedience to what he commands us. The, the, I, be, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians says what? It tells us not to quench the spirit. How do you quench the spirit? Oh, when the spirit of God is leading you and you're like, nah, nah, nah. When the spirit of God is moving and you're like, nah, I got this. The spirit of God is leading you. I'm good. Listen, church, we want the God of peace to be with us so we can bring peace to this world. So we got to meditate on the right things and we have to live the right way. So here's my closing question for you. Where is God's peace not ruling in your life? Where is God's peace not ruling in your life? Maybe it has to do with your finances. Maybe it has to do with your family, maybe your marriage, maybe your relationship with your parents, maybe your relationship with your children. Maybe it's a coworker situation. Maybe it's a neighbor situation. Where is it that God's peace is not ruling in your life? He wants to rule. The question is, will you let him rule? Bow your heads, please. So if you're in this place today <clears throat> and you, you're struggling with God's peace, you know that God's peace isn't ruling in a specific area. Maybe you haven't surrendered your life to him and you need to surrender your life to him. I want to pray specifically for people. And so if you're in here and you are struggling in an area of your life where God's peace is not ruling and you say, God, I want to submit that area to you and I want you to reign and rule peace in my life. If there's an area, just raise your hand right where you are so I can pray for you. Hallelujah. I see the hands. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come. We come before you today and we acknowledge we need your peace. The enemy has worked overtime, God, to steal peace. But Lord, we know that you are the Prince of Peace, and so we surrender to you. We surrender to you, God, and we ask you, reign in us, rule in us. Let us meditate on those things that position us for your peace to reign in our lives. Father, we are so grateful because we know that you did in your son for us and we could never do for ourselves. Father, break the chains of anxiety. Break the chains of insecurity and fear right now in Jesus' name. Break the chains of doubt right now in Jesus' name. Father, perfect us in your love and fill us with your peace that we may not only experience your peace, but that we would express it and share it with a world that desperately needs the peace that only you can give. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a hand of praise. He's worthy. is upon us. It is a time for us to slow down and think about the real meaning of Christmas. This year we will be talking about the gift of hope, wisdom, love, and joy. Starting next week, we will be focusing on the gift of hope. We hope to see you there. Hello Church, Minister Stephen here. I just wanted to reach out to you all to let you know that we are currently looking for more volunteers uh, to serve on Sunday mornings for our kids ministry. Uh, if you have a heart for the kids, and you have any questions or concerns at all, feel free to reach out to me and we'll get you connected. Hope to see you soon.